Let's see. We want to go. Okay, we'll, we'll go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for everything that you've shown us, that you continue to show us. We are just, we're just people seeking to know your will, to know you and to know your son through the information that you've seen fit to give us. And we recognize that whatever the rest of our lifespan happens to be, uh, we could we could spend every moment of every hour and and come to know more and more things all the time. We thank you for graciously allowing us to to learn what we have time to learn during our lifetimes. We pray for the hasty return of your son because we're supposed to look forward to that and uh, in the meantime we pray that that what we learn through these times when we study your word would be material that God the Holy Spirit would see fit to work into our lives and to work out of our lives into our experience and the experience of others. We ask that God the Holy Spirit would make your word clear as it comes forth during this remaining session together. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so Paul started his career really at his conversion uh, with his instructions from Jesus Christ that he was going to be witness not only in what Christ had appeared to him, but in the things in which Christ would appear to him. And he received direct revelation over a period of, of many years uh, so that, that in Galatians, which was probably... Uh, written shortly after the Council of Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul had reported that even before the, con the Council of Jerusalem, A.D. 49, <clears throat> he'd received a gospel message by direct revelation. He had received instructions to go to Jerusalem by direct revelation. Uh, years later, in the late 50s, or right around... Uh, A.D. 60, most likely, during his two-year imprisonment, the Apostle Paul wrote that, uh, that I, Paul, the prisoner for the sake of, I, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles, uh, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation I received the mystery, which I wrote about previously in a few words, uh, how that when you read, you may have my insight into the mystery of Christ. How did he receive that? by direct revelation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we have this stunning verse, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So revelations is used in the plural here. There's a, a lot of doctrine wrapped up into one verse, but let's we'll stick with the program tonight as we close uh, out our survey of the Pauline epistles. 
Revelations is in the plural. Paul was saying to keep me from becoming conceited because of the the surpassing greatness of the revelations. What revelations? The one Paul had been, the ones Paul had been receiving. The the segments, if you will, of revelations. The the threads of revelation. At ver- the sequences of revelation. So, the revelations he received over his career. You couldn't just you you couldn't in an evening receive the the substance that went into for example his letter to the ephesians that that came over many years of revelations and it was progressive the nature of paul's epistles i hope you've detected it as we've done the survey the nature of the revelation becomes progressive. It grows in, uh, in substance, in nature, from the very saving message which Christ received to the nature of the work Christ accomplished on the cross for salvation in Romans and in Galatians to the revelation of what this very dispensation is about, which is a, a temporary departure from the, pro, the prophetic program Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, in which the Gentiles are being temporarily blessed while Israel's covenant promises are reserved for Israel, but kept for Israel on hold. And then in Ephesians, the revelation of the mystery which describes the very nature of the body of Christ. And of course, there's, there's overlap with these letters where we have even the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 28, a very early epistle. And yet the, the fact that uh, there is no distinction in our spiritual position in Christ between Jew and Gentile, between slave and free, between male and female. We have the the, uh, unique exit and resurrection of the church of this present dispensation, the translation for some believers, those who are living, the resurrection for those who are dead, in uh, his earliest, possibly his earliest epistle, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, and an early epistle, A.D. 55, 1 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is, we shall not all die physically, uh, concerning every member of the body of Christ, but we shall all be changed. So, in other words, some of us will be translated into our glorified bodies, not have died and have received resurrection bodies. So there's there's overlap, but there's a definite progress in these letters leading all the way up to... Uh, the what we call the pastoral epistles or shepherding epistles, which lay down the guidelines for church administration and also include much material 
uh, to Timothy and Titus, who were prototype A and B of the shepherd teacher of the present dispensation. And a lot of the material in it was uh, written directly to show how the communicator of doctrine during the present dispensation should communicate and should oversee the local assembly. So, therefore, let us go to tonight in closing, uh, or possibly in closing, unless we have time and I'm led to go elsewhere. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy being Paul's final epistle written to Timothy and, of course, by extension to us because it was included in the Scripture, canonized, overseen by God the Holy Spirit. And we have Paul's charge to Timothy, and by extension to uh, to we during this present dispensation who shepherd and teach as to what is to be the focal point of our ministry. Second Timothy 4 verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete Patience, and that should be translated forbearance, long-suffering or forbearance, with complete forbearance, that is putting up with a lot of provocation from those who don't like what you do. So let's take it again. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete forbearance and teaching, or I think the King James Version puts it doctrine. It is uh, didache, doctrine or teaching. Now, this is... The this is what is entrusted. This is the uh, how how do I put this? This is the function that is entrusted to the shepherd who teaches in Ephesians four uh, eleven, and this. On the surface may seem, and it, it does seem to many, many people, including many Christians, it seems somewhat authoritarian. It seems like, well, that's an awful lot of, uh, it's an awful lot of power to put into the hands of, of a man. Well, It may seem authoritarian, and it may seem like uh, that is uh, uh, placing too much power in the hands of a man, but the fact is that the power is the power of God. It is the power of the Word of God, and it is the function that is entrusted to those who study and teach local assemblies 
It is entrusted to those with the gift to oversee the local assembly and to teach the local assembly, to shepherd the local assembly by teaching the local assembly. And all of these things are facets of the ministry of the Word of God. The preaching and uh, the reproof, uh, rebuke, exhort, all of these things mean pretty much what they do in the English. There are various nuances and uh, several meanings of each of these words. One of the meanings of exhortation, because it's uh, parakaleo, which is from the word near and uh, kaleo, to call, para, near, kaleo, to call, call near, which is really what exhortation is. That's one aspect of exhortation. You're, you're God, through the communicator, is attempting to call people near to divine viewpoint. And it's very serious business. And it is, it, while it may seem authoritarian, it is really a divinely designed function to lead the soul of members of the body of Christ to spiritual freedom. In Galatians 5, verse 2, the Apostle Paul wrote, It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. In other words, it was because of the very principle of freedom that Christ has set us free. So therefore, keep standing firm and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say in John 8, verses 31 and 32 to certain Jews who had believed on him? He said, if you continue, literally, if you continue in the word, that is the logos, the information that is given through the scripture, Jesus Christ is the word, the information, personified, the word of Christ is the mind of Christ. That is the information we have received in the canon of Scripture is the mind of Christ. And Jesus said, if you continue in the word, you will be my disciples indeed. So there you have the difference that, that certain people should know, uh, lordship, salvation, theologists, or theologians, uh, five-point Calvinists, Arminians as well. But they should understand there's a difference between what brings a person into salvation and what brings a person into discipleship. Jesus, in John 8, 31, was speaking to Jews who had believed. And he said to those who had believed, believers, 
were regenerate. Now, there were some in the crowd, and there isn't even a personal pronoun used. There's only a, a verb tense used, which means plural, which means more than one he was speaking to because all the Jews didn't believe. So, so some in the crowd then... Uh, then gave Christ some argument about who he was. I forget the details. But the point is, he was speaking to the Jews who had believed when he said, if you continue in the word, then you are my disciples indeed. There is a difference between how a person becomes regenerate and how a person becomes a disciple. Not all of those who become regenerate become disciples. Those who become regenerate, we will see in heaven. And some of those believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps through one of those corrupt gospel messages I was telling you about, but the Holy Spirit uh, condescended to human arrogance and focused the unbeliever's attention on the believe on Jesus Christ part. And in spite of all the the other insertions into the gospel message, the false insertions into the gospel message, the person believed on Jesus Christ and got saved. But typically what happens is through if they respond to a gospel message like that and become saved, they're all run, they're already under bad teaching. So many believers never really uh take very many positive steps in the spiritual life. They don't, they don't bear very much spiritual fruit at all. I would, I would agree with a person that, that says if any, if any person has been a believer for very much of any length of time, they're going to bear some spiritual fruit. They can't help it. They can't help once in a while, but respond to something God the Holy Spirit gives them if they hear the word of God at all, even in a terrible message. And in their positive response, in their thinking to anything that the, the Holy Spirit points out to them in the word, they are bearing spiritual fruit. Between Mary and Martha, who did Jesus say is bearing the spiritual fruit? To Martha, who was, was busy and distracted by many things and thinking she was doing a good job being busy for Jesus and preparing his lunch? No, he commended the faith of Mary, who was simply sitting at his feet and listening to his word in Luke chapter 10. So, there's quite a difference between what constitutes, sal uh, what constitutes belief or faith unto salvation and what constitutes discipleship. If you continue in the word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So there we have it, two scriptures that show us that it's not about authoritarianism on the part of anyone who shepherds or teaches. It's all about spiritual freedom. Number three, we have 2 Corinthians 1 verse 24 where the Apostle Paul says, not that we lord it over your faith, 
but rather we are workers for your joy. Or as one translation says, not that we dominate your faith, but we're workers for your joy because in the faith that is in your response to the word of God, you stand firm. So it's not about authoritarianism on the part of the communicator of Bible doctrine. Oh, certainly there are those who abuse their God-given authority, who go beyond their God-given authority. Of course there are. But they are to be recognized and uh, uh, victims of, of this kind of abuse are free to go elsewhere. But what the pulpit ministry is about is about the communicator preaching the word and being ready in season and out of season to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete forbearance and teaching. And by this, we communicators of Bible doctrine are to not dominate your faith or lord it over you, but to be helpers of your joy. And that's the greatest, the greatest privilege a communicator can have is to actually lead people into the discovery of the spiritual freedom that they have and help them experience that freedom and be helpers of their joy. And as we, uh, as we get into this next uh, portion, I say portion because we may go out sometime again from Second Corinthians once we get back into it, into another study. I've done this for years. It took me six years to, to teach Ephesians. And I think, it was, I think it was worth every minute of it. But we did a lot of comparative scripture. We did a lot of, uh, of correlative studies. But when we get back into Paul's salutation, we've been dealing with grace and the fact that he's the grace apostle, and that's why we've studied his career and the order of his, uh, the, the rough order of his writings in his career, as best we can, we can put them together. Because he's the grace apostle. And every uh, one of his letters cries out grace. But then another word common to all of his letters is what comes next in our Ephesians or in our study of Second Corinthians, peace. The Greek word irene. And we have peace with God in our position with God in Romans 5, verse 1, because we are reconciled with God and because we are justified. It is because we are justified as a gift through faith that we are reconciled to God, and we have peace with God. But unfortunately, many believers in Christ do not experience in their souls 
the peace that we all have with God in our position. And there are two major reasons for that, and that's going to be the subject of study for perhaps months to come. The two major reasons we do not experience the peace with God that we have is because uh, either and, or either or, or I can say both are true, Uh, at the same time, but either we are not in a truthful relationship with God, that is, we have not acknowledged known sin to God, we've concealed sin through these incredible means we have to suppress truth in our souls, and to deny truth, and to rationalize truth, and to project the, the, the project the disturbing things we see about ourselves onto other people, thinking other people have the problem. We don't. And believers can do that for years. And so we're at odds with God and fail to acknowledge the truth. And acknowledging the truth to God necessitates telling the truth to ourselves. That's why we don't acknowledge the truth to God. And then reason number two, we're not in a truthful relationship with people. We haven't made things right with people where our untruthfulness has caused problems in relationships. And so we'll be dealing with both of those things at length in the coming months uh, of study from the Greek word irene. Well, be, this is one of those cases sometimes in a Pauline letter we go over the salutation very quickly. In this case, uh, not so. But in any case, this is all going to be part of the uh, reproof, the rebuke, uh, the exhort, uh, part of the, the functionality uh, or the function of the pulpit. And, and uh, always remember, I get it before you get it. I have to deal with it before you deal with it. I have to face it before you face it. And, uh, and, that's just the way it, it's the way it works. That's it's all the fun of being together in a local assembly. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for all that you give us. Uh, we ask that uh, we would reflect on what we've learned in the life of Paul and the writings of Paul, the communication of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that we will be uh, challenged where appropriate and always edified and encouraged in grace by the things to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.